what we've been looking in the book of Acts, several things there <clears throat> about the early church. And so we are continuing. We are continuing in the book of Acts there. And we've seen on how the Holy Spirit is, on how when the Holy Spirit is received, that there is action. We saw that when the disciples received the Holy Spirit, they did something. There were, they, they, they worked for God. And the evidence that you are filled with the Holy Spirit is that you are doing something for God. There are many things that can be done, but we, we, we've seen that there in the book of Acts. We've seen also that the Holy Spirit impresses on us to do something, and when we ignore that, that impression, when we ignore that voice, we are sinning against the Holy Spirit. And so we, we saw that through the story there of, Anani of Ananias and Sapphira, that it was God's idea for them to sell the property and to give some of the money to the church. It was God's idea, but because they, they had shunned and pushed God, they sinned against the Holy Spirit. We saw already that God expects the church to think big. Their way, and he commissioned them to not just preach and teach there in Jerusalem, but eventually the whole world to think big and this is why Pastor Austin and myself have really stepped out and are really stepping out in faith. When we decided to fill the baptistry every first Sabbath. Now this is not to say that we're just going to baptize any person that raises their hand and wants to get baptized right that same day. There is preparation to be done, there, there is um, reviewing to, to be done but we at the same time, it also puts Pastor Austin and myself more to work, amen, on why we became pastors, which is for winning souls. And let me tell you, we can get caught up in so many other things and neglect a simple Bible study with someone else. And it also, I hope, encourages you to help us in bringing souls to the kingdom of heaven. God expects us to think big and we also saw there that we don't need more of the Holy Spirit but that the Holy Spirit needs more of us. The Holy Spirit is, is always talking to us, is always convicting us, is, is always calling us. And sometimes we say, Lord, we need more of the Holy Spirit but the Holy Spirit is always here but He's just wanting more of you and me. He's just wanting more of our hearts to submit to Him. So my subject today, what do you see when the stones come? There, Acts chapter 7. Let's, bow, uh, let's just pray one, pray one more time. Father in heaven, as we open your word, I ask that you open our hearts and, uh, and as Harry had mentioned, remove any evil influence here. That, your, that our minds may be open and that you fill us with your spirit and that we listen to your voice and not mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I invite you there to turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7. Let's look there to the gospel according to Luke in the book of Acts. Dr. Luke did write the book of Acts. So it is his gospel there in Acts chapter 7 verse 54 where I appreciate Michael reading the scripture reading the, the, the scripture verses there. <clears throat> Acts chapter 7 verse 54 where it begins when they heard these things just a little context here is the deacon Stephen preaching and he preached a sermon to the Jewish leaders there revealing to them that Jesus was the Messiah and showed them even with Old Testament evidence. He showed them with Old Testament evidence. And so there it continues, when they heard these things they were cut to the heart. Friends, when truth is hit in our face, sometimes we are cut to the heart. And we can react in one or two ways when the truth hurts and is presented right to our face. We can, like the Jews here, where it says, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. We can take a bad attitude, a rebellion attitude, 
or we can submit and say, you know what, that's right, that's truth. And so here, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, but they were not repentive, because it says, and they gnashed at him with their teeth, verse, verse 55, but he, talking about Stephen, being full of what? The Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Don't miss that. While they were angry at him and ready to stone him, Stephen is seeing Jesus. And said, verse 56, Look, I see the heaven opening and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they, then they cried out with a loud voice, stop, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. <clears throat> and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God. Praise the Lord, friends. Are you imagining this? He was calling to God while they were stoning him. Now, he wasn't calling to God as we're going to read here. Lord, get them right now. Lord, stop the rocks from coming to me. No, what, what is he calling on God? Saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He fell asleep. While Stephen was being stoned, he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus. And I want you to know that you can see Jesus while you're being stoned. Yes. That you should see Jesus while you are being stoned while the stones are coming to you if you want to make it to glory friends to heaven you have to see Jesus through the stones in your life you have to keep your eyes on Jesus keep your eyes on Jesus because trouble for a Christian is going to come if you join me there in 2nd Timothy chapter 3 2nd Timothy chapter 3 Troubles and problems are going to come to the Christian. Not only to the non-Christian, but even to the Christian. There, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. He's making it clear with a big yes to begin with. Yeah. Don't think that you're going to somehow get away from it or maybe sneak out from persecution or problems or trouble. No, yes, if you desire to live godly in Jesus. Now there's a key. Sometimes, oh, I wish I had the, I wish I had the reference, but... Great controversy tells us that if we want a revival in the church, we need a little bit of more persecution to come in. Because persecution reveals, reveals what is in the heart. If people are living godly for Christ, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Just turn a little bit forward to the book of James. James chapter 1. And we've, we looked at James during prayer meeting a couple of months ago before we uh, started looking at the, life of, at the life of David. But here in James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Here James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces, and my Bible says, patience. Does somebody else have a different word? Endurance. Endurance. Thank you. 
endurance. Doesn't Jesus say, he who endures to the end shall be saved? He absolutely says that. And how do we get endurance? How do we endure? Here, my brethren, come in our joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. The trials that God allows helps us to, be, to endure more, to be more mature in the faith. Now the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is how they handle the trials, how we handle the trouble. Every one of us, every single person has trouble, either good or bad, Christian or, or non-Christian. Problems and troubles come to everyone. But it is how people handle the trouble, the stress, the problems that reveals where their faith is. And even the early church had problems and troubles. Besides persecution, if you study, if you study history of Christianity, the Romans persecuted the Christians. The Romans persecuted the Christians. Many emperors persecuted the Christians. And besides those troubles, they even had internal issues. And we looked at this before already where, where we saw in the book of Acts that there was theological conflicts, that there was personality conflicts amongst themselves. But yet God was still in his church and God was still blessing his church. But the reason why the church prospered was because like Stephen, they would see Jesus through their problems. They would see Jesus through the stones that, are being, that were being thrown at them. During the early church, the news of the Savior was spread throughout the entire empire. The message changed hearts and they began to work and do something. Converts came from everywhere. Even people that were against Jesus became followers of Jesus. The church became single-minded to reflect Jesus Christ. The church became single-minded to reflect Jesus Christ. And when we get there, friends, when we as a church, when we as Cleveland First get to that point and become single-minded to reflect Jesus Christ, we will be a different church. When we decide to be like Jesus, when in our marriages we decide to be like Jesus, when we relate at work to others like Jesus, when we deal with our children to be like Jesus, when we, be, when we purpose in our minds and single-minded to reflect Jesus Christ, when that becomes our ultimate goal, this will be a different church, friends. It will be like the early church. Because the early church had courage bigger than the devil's intimidations. When you read there just the book of Acts and even, and even other parts of the, of, the, of the early church in the New Testament, but especially in the book of Acts, you see the church's courage is so big, much bigger than the devil's intimidations. And so let, let me remind you that whatever blessings the early church received, whatever power from the Holy Spirit they received, we will receive much bigger power. Because they received the early rain, but we will receive the latter rain, the bigger rain. Acts of the Apostles, page 55, says, but near the close of earth's harvests, a special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. And so we, God is going to pour out His Holy Spirit even much more. And He even told that to His disciples when He said, you see me doing this, you will do much greater things. Much greater things. But here reflecting again on the life of Stephen and the stoning of Stephen, I, wanted, I want us to focus that Stephen did not request, notice in his prayer, you know, to, to, to stop the stoning. And sometimes Satan may distract us or distract this church 
in changing our focus away from Jesus. And many of our prayers become selfish prayers. Many of our prayers may deal with, Lord, heal me. Lord, help, I can't pay my bill. Lord, I can't pay my rent. And those are good prayers. I'm not saying we can't pray those. The Lord tells us to pray for what we need. But they are, they are and should not be the priority prayers for last day people. Our priority prayers should be that God fills our personal lives and that we submit to the will of the Holy Spirit. That should be our priority prayer. Because if the Holy Spirit is in us and fills us, He will take care of our needs. He will take care of our necessities. He tells us that in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added to you. Everything else will be added to you. Even when Jesus was talking about the signs at the end, you know, when he talks about there will be earthquake and there will be troubles and there will be famines and all these signs that which we see today, this world is getting worse and worse, not just with natural disaster signs, but even in morality. Even in morality. And those are all signs that Jesus is coming soon. And Jesus, there in Luke 21, verse 28, when he wraps up or he is concluding the signs at the end, he says, Now when you see these things being, begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. When you see these signs, look up to who? Look up to Jesus. Look up to God because your redemption draws near. The atmosphere in the last days will be, will be filled with trouble. And do not let your focus be primarily on the troubles, on your troubles. Just, just look at the book of Jeremiah with me. Jeremiah chapter 29. We're going to see people that were in trouble. Jeremiah chapter 29. And sometimes we think the troubles that we get, the trials that we get, that, that, that God has forgotten about us, that God has abandoned us. And sometimes we may, like Jesus, say, Lord, Lord, where are you? There in Jeremiah chapter 29, and this is a familiar verse that we, that, uh, we may have read or heard before. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Here the Bible says, and God is, is telling Jeremiah and his people, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. But when you read the context, when you read, the, when you read chapter 28, and even the, most of the book of Jeremiah, this, this chapter... In Jeremiah chapter 29, the context is written to people who are captive in Babylon. People who are captive, captive in Babylon. And it is written to people with problems and troubles there in Babylon who maybe thought that God has abandoned them. God has left them. And friends, this world is sick like Babylon. And while we are in it and we cannot get out of it, God is telling us, don't think that my thoughts toward you are evil. If you're going through a hard time, if you got fired for standing up maybe for what, for what was right, if you got sick, if you got a disease, if you lost someone, if you prayed, for a necessity and I, and I did not answer it, do not think, God is saying, do not think that my thoughts for you are evil. My thoughts are not, for you, are not evil for you. While troubles are coming, while troubles are coming, God is asking us not to question Him. Not to question Him. And that's why, going back to the book of Acts, Chapter 7. Why then did God allow Stephen, a good man, an asset to the church? He was bilingual, full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Why would God allow 
a man like this to be stoned to death? The same question we can ask about John the Baptist. A man full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus even says he is the greatest prophet of all. And he was pointing people to Jesus. His disciples, he says, there is a lamb. You got to stop following me. Follow Jesus now. That is the son of God. And, and yet, we can ask, why did God allow his life to be cut short? You see, friends, God cannot take us to his kingdom until you and I become totally submissive to whatever he does, whenever he does it, and however he does it. Both John the Baptist and both here Stephen were submissive to God's will. Did they understand it? Maybe they did not. Maybe they did. That's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether they understand it, but they were submissive to God's will. I don't know if any of you parents, maybe your, your children ask you, but why can I do it? And sometimes we just say, it doesn't matter. Because I say so, you cannot do it. Or you cannot go. It's irrelevant, the explanation. But they were submissive to God's will. And God cannot take us to his kingdom until you and I become totally submissive to whatever he does in our lives, whenever he does it, and however he does it. And what greater example do we have than Jesus at the cross? Then Jesus at the cross saved you and I by making himself fully helpless. Could Jesus have come down? Yes. Could he have called the angels to come down? Yes. Could Jesus have even the ones nailed him, given him le le leprosy right there? Yes but he became completely helpless to save you and me. And sometimes we think that we're going to order God in our prayers and say, Lord, you have to do, Lord, I'm waiting for you to do this. And we are not submissive to God's will in our lives. Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah chapter 55. This ver I know that the scriptures are written in the bottom of your bulletin and this one is not in there because I just put it as the choir was singing beautifully. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. And we're familiar with this where God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Here he re reminds us and I remind you that God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. You want the answer for this, to this prayer? Well, you know what? That's not my thoughts. Why? For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's thoughts are... You see, God sees the entire effect of our prayer request. And sometimes... He looks at our prayer request and he says, if I answer this, you are going to fail later here. And I prefer to save you. God only knows and sees the entire effect of our prayer, the entire effect of our lives and gives us what is best and gives us what we need. And we may not understand, but that's okay because he tells us right here, my thoughts are not like your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. I've, my thoughts are way much higher than your ways. Just how a parent's thoughts are much higher than a child's thoughts and knows what is best for the child, so our Heavenly Father knows what is best for us. And so with that in mind, stuff will happen to you and to me. Stuff will happen in our lives, but God will still be God. God will still be God. We always want, we always want to know the why. Yes, we, we always want to know the why. But God doesn't pass out why cards. 
Well, this is why I did that. Well, this is why I did this. He passes out love cards. God's good people's prayers may not be answered. Healthy people may get cancer. People even who marry in the church may have a bad marriage as those who marry outside of the church. Seventh-day Adventists may lose their job over the Sabbath, no matter even how many times you have prayed. You may still lose your job over the Sabbath. And I can testify to that for losing a job over the Sabbath. Our children may do drugs. When the storm comes and tornadoes hit, your home may get blown away. Because you're a Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist doesn't mean that you're that abstain from any problems or troubles or dangers. In the midst of the stones that are coming to you, your temptation will be to doubt whether doing God's will has any benefits at all. In the midst of the stones that the devil is throwing to you, your temptation will be to doubt whether doing God's will has any benefit. Is, it, if, is there any benefit in even being a Christian, friends? The minute you go there, the minute you go there, the devil's got you. The devil has got you. And some of us are letting our minds, our brains become bait for the devil. And I just appeal to you, do not judge God by incidents in your life. But judge God by his character. By his character. See, God's actions may not always be connected to your life's walk. In most of the time, they are connected to your life's walk. But God's actions sometimes may not be connected to your life's walk. They may be connected to your life's needs. There's a difference. Sometimes God allows something not because you are walking in that direction, but because you may need that. You may need that. When God asked his prophet to go marry a harlot, he wasn't walking in that direction, but God needed his people and his prophet to see on how they were treating him, on how Israel was being unfaithful and God wanted his people to see personally. And this is why in the Lord's Prayer, in the Lord's Prayer there in Matthew chapter 6, God taught us to pray. And in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, we pray and we ask, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. So if God the Father in heaven has a will that maybe on earth here, it is not our will. We're asking, Lord, you take my will and make it your will, whatever it is in heaven. And sometimes that's a dangerous prayer because sometimes God's will is not our will. The Lord did not stop a good, holy man from being stoned. And it looked like God is totally absent. Yet Stephen, what did he say? I see Jesus standing right next to the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he even uses the same words that Jesus did at the cross where he says, Lord, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you see Jesus you have no hatred. When you see Jesus, you have no revenge toward the stones that are coming. When you see Jesus, you have no dislike. I invite you to look at your meditation there in the back of your bulletin. From, taken, taken from Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 117. It says, you know, something, you know something of what it means to pass through trials. Do you, church? Yeah. yeah. We sure do. 
You know something of what it means to pass through trial. These have given you the opportunity of trusting in God, of seeking Him in earnest prayer that you may believe in Him and rely upon Him with simple faith. It is by suffering that our virtues are tested and our faith tried. It is in the day of trouble that we feel the preciousness of Jesus. You will be given opportunity. Notice this next sentence. You will be given the opportunity to say like Job, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. You will be given that opportunity. What is that saying? You're going to get hard times. You're going to get trials. You're going to be put to the fire. But will you answer like Job? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Oh, it is so precious to think that opportunities are afforded us to confess our faith, our, our, our faith in the face of danger and aim sorrow, sickness, pain, and death. Oh, it is so precious. Notice that. Look, notice the vocabulary she's using. Notice, oh, it is so precious, the joy. That, that sounds like James. Come the joy when you go through trials. Oh, it is so precious to think that opportunities are afforded to us to confess our faith in the face of danger and aim, sorrow, sickness, pain, and death. What is she saying? It is a joy. It is precious to think that while we have hard times, we can show the world that we still love Jesus. And though he slay me, I will trust in him. I will follow him. Just like those three Hebrew boys when they say, our God can deliver us to the fire. But if he does not, let it be known we ain't going to worship your God at all. They were willing still to be a testimony for Jesus. So what do you see when the stones come, church? What do you see? Do you see the stones only? And complain against the stones? You see, when a person dies by stoning, there comes a point. You see, every stone hurts. And there comes a point that maybe the person prays for that perfect stone to hit in the perfect place in the head just to knock you out. Otherwise, it's a slow, painful death of being stoned. But how does, this, how does the story end there in Acts chapter 7 in verse 60? Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen went to sleep. He found peace in Jesus in the midst of the stones and submitted fully to the will of God, friends. Fully to the will of God. To make it to glory, you have to submit to God's will and be okay to where to whatever, be okay to wherever God leads you. When you submit to God, you have to get to the point where, that you are okay to wherever he leads you. To be okay wherever he leads you. But friends, take courage because 1 Corinthians 10.13 is a promise that tells us God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Notice that. Not to escape it, but to bear it. To suck it up and trust in God and bear it. Stephen here, Luke didn't record anything that Stephen tried to escape and dodge maybe and try to get away. No. No. He basically said, Lord, he even said here, I commit, receive my spirit. My life is in your hands. If you want me to go right now, then take me right now. 
That's why he even told Peter when he came out with that knife to defend Jesus, Take, put that away. You don't need that. Here, Stephen did not show any signs, you know, of fighting back or no. He submitted and gave his life to God. And if God wanted to put him to sleep, he said, Lord, just forgive them because they have no idea what they're doing. And so I appeal, church, what do you see when the stones come to you? If we let him, Jesus will lead us all the way. He may lead us to trials. He may lead us to prosperity. He may lead us to a test. Have you ever thought when he took Israel out of Egypt, where did he lead them to? I heard the promised land. That's the wrong answer. He, de he led them to the wilderness, to the desert. He took them out of slavery, and their goal was to go to the promised land, right? Flowing milk and honey and prosperous, a land to be free. Did they go there right away? He led them out from slavery and into the desert, into the wilderness, into trials into troubles, into a place where there were snakes. But you see, every time they kept their eyes on Jesus, their trials were taken care of. Their food was provided. Their water was provided. God protected them with a hedge that no snakes bit them. Only until they rebelled that God said, you don't want my help, and he stepped back, and then the snakes just came in and did their job. But meanwhile, they kept their eyes on Jesus and Moses doing his job and keeping their eyes on Jesus. Their trials were taken care of. Their clothes did not get old. Their shoes and sandals did not waste. Their food was provided. Their water was provided. Shade was provided. Heat was provided at night. They had everything. Meanwhile, they kept their eyes on Jesus. So when he took them out, he took them out to the wilderness. So I pray that when stones, the stones of life come to you, friends, when the stones of life come to you, that you keep on seeing Jesus. Yes. That you keep your eyes on Jesus. Because stones will come if they haven't already. And greater stones are coming greater stones, friends, are coming for this church. But meanwhile, we keep and submit our will and our lives to God. God may allow some of us to go to sleep because that is what's best for us, and He knows better. And God may allow some of us maybe to go and defend our faith in the courts because He knows that that, that individual will be a testimony. God may allow some to go somewhere else but whatever God allows, just as it is in, his, in the Lord's prayer, and even here in Stephen's prayer, and we pray, Lord, let not my will be done, but your will be done. And God, praise the Lord, gives us the strength, and praise the Lord also is faithful that he does not allow temptation that we can't handle to come to us. Praise the Lord for that friends. That is encouraging to know that the devil just can't do anything he wants with us. He may do something and God says that's fine. You want to touch Harley with that? I know he can handle it. Meanwhile, he keeps his faith in me. Go ahead. Didn't he do that to Job? He sure did. You want to touch him? That's fine. Go ahead. And Job kept his eyes on Jesus, his faith in him. And so I just pray and I thank God because there may be trial that the devil wants to hit us and God knows, you know what? This is a baby child of mine and that temptation, uh-uh, you ain't gonna give it to him. I thank God for that. I thank that God still pulls the reins on Satan and says, not that one for Harley. Not that one for brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Praise the Lord, friends. 
But the ones that he does say, Sister Stevens, she can take care of that because she always keeps her eyes on me. Brother Leland, he can take care of that because he always keeps his eyes on me. Mrs. Stewart, she can take care of that because she always keeps her eyes on me. And we need to keep praying, Lord, I submit my life to you. And he will lead us, sometimes to trials, sometimes to blessings, sometimes to prosperity, and sometimes to tests. But friends, I just appeal to you that when the stones come, when the stones come, that you keep on looking at Jesus like Stephen, that you may see Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, some of us maybe are overwhelmed with the stones that we're already getting hit. And maybe we're focusing on the stones and trying to crawl away from the stones. But Lord, forgive us if we have turned our attention away from you and help us to focus our attention on you. And just as the song says, to keep our eyes on Jesus. Look full into his marvelous face. And the things of earth will dim away. The things of earth will fade away. And so, Father in heaven, help us to keep our eyes on you in everything that we do and say and hear. And we submit our hearts and our lives to you. And if we have not done so, Lord, please forgive us. Forgive us. For you know every single heart. You know every single heart. And so help us, Lord, to submit our lives to you and that we may be content with what you allow in our lives. We give you the honor and glory and I ask that you help us to be a testimony to others that whatever may happen, we may say that though you slay us, we will continue trusting in you. Be with your church, bless your church, and bless your people at the day approaches of your soon coming. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.